going on. Okay, so let me. So hello and welcome to Digging In. And I'm Lindsay Randall, the host of the speaker series. And Digging In is a series of live presentations with archeologists from around the country, co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archeology span and the Massachusetts Archeological Society. And you can join us every other Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time through November for all of our presentations. For a schedule of dates and presenters, please visit us at pbd.andover.edu or at the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's Facebook page. Additionally, all presentations will be uploaded to the YouTube channels of the Peabody Institute and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. During the talk, viewers are able to submit questions directly to me via the chat function on the side of your Zoom screen. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will give our speaker time to answer as many of your questions as they can with the understanding that we might not make it to all of them. And today we are very excited to have Dr. Alex Martin joining us. Dr. Martin is the archeologist at Strawberry Bank Museum. She directs annual archeological field schools and is responsible for maintaining the museum's collections of over 1 million archeological artifacts. Dr. Martin is also a faculty fellow in the anthropology department at the University of New Hampshire. She has a BA in anthropology from Mount Holyoke College and an MA and PhD in anthropology and historical archeology span from the College of William and Mary. Dr. Martin started her archeological career as a volunteer for scrap in her hometown of Merrimack, New Hampshire, when she was just 12 years old. She has worked throughout New England as a student, field technician, lab manager, and field school director. Her work has also taken her to the Caribbean, the American Southwest, Africa Town in Alabama, and Colonial Williamsburg. Welcome, Dr. Martin. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's nice to see a bunch of people. So Lindsay had actually invited me to give a talk um, in person this spring that got canceled, um, you know, in that first wave of cancellations of basically our whole lives in mid-March. Um, so I was really excited to have an opportunity to present anyway, albeit from my home here in Dover. Um, I have my dog Luna with me. Um, but I'll be able to share some information about Starby Bank archaeology with you. So let me get my screen shared here. There we go. Does that look great? Yeah. Final screen. Okay. So I'm going to give you a like tiny brief introduction to Strawberry Bank Museum for those of you who haven't been before and then talk about three of the major archaeological sites that we've been working on recently and share a couple of interesting finds from them um, and then leave plenty of time for questions about like other research or volunteer or future opportunities when we can get back to normal. So Strawberry Bank is a living history museum in downtown Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We have a approximately 10 acre campus with about 40 historic buildings, most of which are on their original foundations. Unlike other living history museums that present a specific year in history, like at Colonial Williamsburg, it's always 1775. Strawberry Bank presents history from its indigenous residents who've lived in the area since time immemorial um, through the 1950s when the last residents of Puddle Dock um, were in residence. Move on here. Video's a little slow over Zoom. So like I was saying, the history of Puddle Dock, the neighborhood that Strawberry Bank is built around, begins in time immemorial. The Abenaki people of New Hampshire, we know from both oral histories and archeological evidence at the museum, used the area a lot like people do today to come in the warm months, um, you know, take advantage of the summer for hunting and fishing. Um, and then they would return inland to more permanent settlements in the colder winter months. The first European settlers to arrive in the area came in 1623 naming the um, neighborhood Strawberry Bank, and the permanent settlement began in 1630. 
throughout the 18th and 19th century, the Puddle Dock neighborhood and um, Starbury Bank, later Portsmouth, around it, grew as an international commercial port and became the shipbuilding, naval, and fishing city that Portsmouth really still is today. By 1904, that open green space you saw it right at the beginning of the video, which had formerly been a tidal inlet, was filled in and Puddle Dock in particular um, became more of an immigrant neighborhood home to Irish and later Jewish immigrants at the turn of the century. Um, especially with the Jewish immigrants, the scrapyard industry came to town, and by the mid-20th century, the neighborhood was slated for urban renewal. Um, the plan was to tear down historic buildings, but fortunately, a group of local preservationists were able to um, purchase the buildings instead and save them and create Strawberry Bank Incorporated. So we've been doing archaeology at Strawberry Bank um, basically since its beginning. Uh, the, the first digs there were in the early 1960s. Um, and you can see in that black and white photo, one of the early excavations of one of the wharfs on Puddle Dock that was excavated by Roland Robbins, who's also famous for um, uncovering the foundation of Thoreau's cabin on Walden Pond. He did things a little differently than we do today, but we still have a, a lot of important archaeological evidence from his investigations. Um, but we've continued to do archaeology over the last 50 plus years to help interpret and inform the houses and the landscape that visitors see, to inform reconstruction of buildings like the privy in the lower left hand corner is a uh, total reconstruction at the Ryder Woodhouse for new construction, like these bathrooms at the Jefferson House, which were added on to a historic structure, um, and through the process of rehabilitation, where by um, needing to repair some of our historic homes, we have rebuilt foundations, or even just adding electrical or water lines. Um, sometimes construction might affect archeological um, resources, so we dig before we let a little bulldozer get in there around the foundation. But one of the most important reasons, I think, that we do archaeology at Strawberry Bank is for education. Of course, the education of the visitors and um, of the general public, I mean, I, you know, we're participating in an educational experience right now, um, but also hands-on education for field school students. So typically in a non-pandemic summer, we have an archeological field school on site at um, a different house, depending on the needs of the construction team or the interpretation plan. Um, and we invite students from around the country to come learn excavation methodology. And this is my favorite time of year because the digs are always open to visitors to come and discuss what's being found, why we're digging. Um, people are always surprised to learn that there's still work to be done at the museum. Um, so it's the, the time of year that archeology span gets the most um, visibility. We also, in the past few years, introduced a lab school by request, really. Students always ask, what are you going to do when we leave and you go back inside? Um, and so I decided to start training them also in the process of the lab work, the cataloging, the research, um, and what goes into preparing um, a report, but also a furnishing plan for our historic houses. And to ensure that there's a public component for that as well, since we don't have the capability to let visitors wander in and out of the lab, the lab school culminates in a public open house where students present their findings to um, invited and regular day visitors. So I wanna talk about a few houses on the museum grounds where we've worked recently. The first is the Yetton Walsh House in the center of campus. It was built in 1803 and used for most of its history as a multifamily home. We first did excavations there, just exploratory phase one kind of research in 2007. And in 2015, trenched around most of the building in advance of a full foundation um, reconstruction. So the main family who lived at this home for 
over 60 or 55 years, whatever that is, um, half a century was the Welch family. And there they are listed across a few censuses. Um, they're a pretty large family who had immigrated from Ireland in the early 1850s, possibly due to the potato famine. Um, and we can see by looking at these documentary records, including city directories, that when they first moved into the home, um, they were sharing it with two other families, but in the 1870s were able to purchase the house for themselves um, and use it as a single family home and ultimately host borders, as you can see on the 1900 census, they're hosting more recent immigrants from Ireland. So we got really into researching the Welches and I discovered some of the descendants um, who are some of whom live in Portsmouth and others of whom live all over the country. Um, but Mary Agnes Welch is one of the kids of Michael and Bridget. So she grew up in the Yetton Walsh house, married Thomas Collins in Portsmouth. Um, they had a bunch of kids and some of their grandkids are still around and provided us with these photos. So before Yetton Walsh house had not been used as a space for the public to visit, but the research we did surrounding the archaeological work and then some of the artifacts themselves have inspired us to interpret the home to the period when the Welch family lived there and talk more about their experience. So just a couple of the interesting artifacts we found that date to the Welch period history include um, this fragment of a child's mug, a little creamware, mug um, with the face of Major General Ulysses S. Grant on it. And apparently this was part of a trend in the late 1800s of decorating children's plates with Civil War generals. Um, you can see the, the embossed alphabet on the plate so you can learn history and your ABCs while you're enjoying your children's meal. Um, also, a couple years ago, one of the field school students spent some time reconstructing some of the transfer wares um, from Yet and Walsh. So here's an example of one of the plates from the Welch kitchen um, that we hope to find a similar example of to um, furnish the house with. We also found some evidence that again relates back to the documentary evidence. So here's a little glass bottle from Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup, which was a treatment for sick children that contained morphine and alcohol. It's popular in the late 19th century and surprisingly enough, outlawed by the FDA, um, I think just after the turn of the century. But we know that Kate Welch, one of the children of Michael and Bridget Welch, um, around this time died at, as an infant of cholera. Um, so it's possible that the presence of Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup in the archaeological assemblage was related to her illness. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving around the campus and move on over to the Penhallow House. This house was built in the mid 18th century, but then moved to Strawberry Bank in 1862. So here it is, just the corner of it depicted in its original location. Um, like a block and a half away on Court and Pleasant Street. And uh, we know it was moved on July 19th, 1862, precisely because of this newspaper clipping. Um, someone got injured in its move. But also handily enough, we found a 1862 Indian head penny in the builder's trench along Washington Street. So this home we are planning to interpret to its mid 20th century um, period when it, as well as a couple other homes along Washington Street where it sits today, were home to African American families. So Jerry Palmer grew up in the house in the 1930s and later her uncle moved into the house as an adult, but here he is pictured. Um, at Portsmouth Junior High School in 1928. So we're still working on looking through the artifacts from this house, but I just wanted to show you a couple um, photos from the excavation. So we were interested in this addition that was put on the back of the house. Um, what was moved in 1862 is what is to 
the right of my sign board on the foundation there. And then a little salt box addition was added later on. Um, and we were exploring the foundation line to see how much repair it needed to help inform our restoration carpenters plan. We also found this really interesting base of cobblestones. Um, it's about 60 centimeters deep, so too deep to have been part of the road. Uh, I think that it was part of some like terraforming or land shaping because this is right on the edge of what was that tidal inlet. And we continued to dig uh, a little bit to the east of our 2016 excavations in 2017 because um, there's going to have to be some moving around of buildings. So we wanted to explore what was next to this building we call the Red Shed before work began on it and found a continuation of that cobblestone feature. So this is helpful to us. We left the cobblestone feature mostly intact. We just dug underneath it in a unit in each excavation block to see what was there. Um, and found a lot of layers of tidal sediment as well as late 17th century artifacts indicating that these were put here after that. Um, but we want to leave it mostly intact. So this is really helpful information to pass along to our restoration carpenter uh, and the construction team who will be making the alterations to these buildings in advance of our future interpretation um, of the home to the Richardson's family's time. And then finally, I want to talk about Sherburn House, which is back on the east side of campus. This is the oldest house on the museum grounds. It was built right on the edge of the tidal inlet in 1695 um, and continued to be occupied over time. Here it is as it looked when the museum acquired it in um, the 1960s. It had become a five family apartment building. You can maybe just see the little five electrical meters and it was covered in this very popular mid-century brick patterned asphalt siding. Um, so it was one of the earliest buildings to be restored by the museum so that it could be opened to the public in the 1960s. So no archeology span went into its restoration at the time. However, in the 1980s, the museum asked the archaeological staff to begin investigating the backyard to help understand how the lot was used at the time the Sherburn family lived there in the early 18th century, um, and then to reconstruct the landscape as it would have looked. So today when you visit, you see um, approximately 1730-ish design, including these raised beds, the fence line. Um, the position of the beds, the layout, even many of the plants that are in the raised beds are all based on the archeological evidence, both features that indicated where post holes or planks had been set to um, plant the raised beds. And then paleoethnobotanical analysis helped inform what types of plants were grown there. And it's largely a kitchen and medicinal garden. Um, although there's some flowering plants, as you can see, it wasn't just for an ornamental experience. And people are sometimes surprised to find that raised beds, you know, so similar to what we are still using today were common, but um, throughout the early 18th century, this is what a lot of people were using for their kitchen gardens. So some other historic uh, research went into the Sherburn Garden as well. Um, we recently, last summer, returned to Sherburn because we're planning to re-restore this house. We have some updates that we'd like to make, some fixes to make to the way things were done in the 1960s, and then just some ideas about how we could better utilize the space. Right now it's an architectural exhibit, but we'd like to have a more furnished space um, and an exhibit that talks more broadly about the experience of the first period in colonial New England. So we targeted this area on the back corner of the house because we were thinking we might need to add um, a second form of egress, maybe a staircase, maybe some HVAC. So it was in response to conversations with the uh, carpentry team. We uncovered a foundation line of an addition that was put on the building in the 1770s. 
uh, as well as a bunch of interesting artifacts that still need to be washed, most of them. We've been stuck out of the lab for a long time. But last summer, the field school students had the opportunity to return to some of the artifacts that had already been processed from those 1980s excavations. And so I want to share some of the things that we're looking at that could potentially go into the exhibit that we're hoping to open around the time of Portsmouth's quadricentennial in 2023. So they were really interested in the people who lived at the Sherburn house. And in addition to the Sherburn family, the Sherburn house was home to two enslaved Africans who are not named in the historic record, but are listed. So um, at first we were looking at some of the more utilitarian early 18th century buttons, but during last summer's excavation, we also found this cowrie shell, um, which is often an indication of an enslaved African on site. And interestingly, right next door to the Sherburn family lived the Marshall family who owned three enslaved Africans who we have a little more documentary evidence about and know they came from the West Indies. Um, but this cowrie shell makes me wonder if the enslaved Africans at Sherburn came directly from Africa. So we're continuing to do research so that we could say a little bit more about the two enslaved Africans at Sherburn. But we also have some personal items or small finds that can tell us more about um, the Sherburn family themselves. So here are a couple um, personal items possibly owned by Mary Sherburn, a thimble and a chain that um, researchers think is part of a chatelaine or like a woman's um, utility belt essentially. And then this swirly metal stick here is a cosmetic spoon that could have been used for scooping cosmetics or scooping earwax. I love that. Um, and here's a couple paste gems from Joseph Sherburn's time and a fragment of a wig curler, which um, are status markers that are kind of unique to the Sherburn family compared to a lot of the other uh, contemporaries in the neighborhood. So just a little taste of Sherburn artifacts. And I wanted to end by mentioning uh, what we're working on right now since we're working from home. So as you can see, we've done a lot of research over the past few years and there's still a lot of report research and article writing to do. We have a remote intern this summer who I know is on the call. She is working from her home in Newton, Massachusetts on research and data entry. And then next week, instead of an in-person field school this summer, we are doing a virtual field school, which will be a one week program um, with some video elements and some activities to help students um, learn some, uh, they're gonna do a little ArcGIS, a little crowdsourcing data work, the types of things that we archeologists are having to shift to these days. So we'll see how that goes. I'll keep you posted. So I'll wrap up there and um, leave us some time here for questions. I have to unmute myself. Um, well, thank you, that was really good. So we have one question and that is, did Portsmouth and the close vicinity largely survive King Philip's war during 1675? And was there any other conflict where Portsmouth was attacked? Yeah, so Portsmouth wasn't really involved in King Philip's war. Of course, they knew about it, but the battles um, didn't make their way to Portsmouth. It was already a really urban center doing a lot of shipping. Um, so I think I get the sense from looking through the historic records at that time that they were busy focusing on that. Um, the only story we have of any conflict with the local Abenaki people is nearby, it might have even been in Newcastle, not Portsmouth, I'd have to check, but apparently some Abenaki men went um, in retaliation for an attack on them and targeted some merchant's wife, um, but it was a really like personal conflict, not part of a larger um, tribal colonial conflict. Okay. Um, also, in terms, oh, 
Could the cobblestones have been used to combat mud? I, yes, I think exactly right. I don't, I don't have the map in the slideshow, um, but even the road that the early settlers used along the tidal inlet, they called Puddle Lane, which suggests to me it wasn't a great road. Um, and we see over time different maps of the neighborhood show the shape of the tidal inlet morphing a little bit. And so, yeah, I think they used this layer, layer and a half of cobblestones to help stabilize the edge of the tidal inlet so that they could, um, you know, who knows, access their ships better, build a wharf on top of it, ultimately build buildings on top of it. Um, we have another question about the buttons. Uh, how do you fasten a button that only has one hole, like one of the ones you showed? Yeah, um, should I go back to it? Sure. Hang on. So one of these you can see actually still has um, a little metal shank in it. So on this side, there's a flattened metal, metal disc, and then there would have been a shaft that went through the hole in the button and had a loop on the other side. So that's the best way to fasten it. You could do the same thing, though, with a knotted piece of thread, have the big knot on one side go through the cloth and knot it on the other side. Okay. Um. Let's see. Uh, for what services might the enslaved people have um, been brought to Portsmouth to do? So in the homes at the museum where we know there were enslaved Africans, there were six of them. I think all of them were also running businesses. So the Sherburn family were there as merchants. They had a shop um, added onto their house. They had a wharf, so they're importing and exporting. Um, and so they could have required assistance with that. At the Marshall Pottery site next door, where I said we know the enslaved Africans came from the West Indies, they were a pottery production site. So they were making and shipping redware ceramics up and down the coast. Um, and then two other houses that I can think of were taverns, and so they uh, enslaved Africans to assist and work in the tavern. Um, so it, it doesn't seem, at least at Strawberry Bank, that uh, many of the residents had just a, an enslaved person to help around the house. Okay. Have you, um, this is just my personal question. Have you guys been working with the African Burial uh, Society in Portsmouth? Because they've been really big at looking at the um, sort of enslaved community that was mm -hmm. there to see how it might inform, you know, how you guys are looking at these, you know, while unnamed rep uh, individuals, very important individuals. Nice. Yeah, definitely. We have a close relationship with, so the African burying ground in Portsmouth is part of the New Hampshire Black Heritage Trail. Um, and they have four sites on the Black Heritage Trail that are on the grounds of Strawberry Bank. Um, and so that for people who aren't familiar with the Portsmouth African burying ground, there were nine individuals that were encountered and disinterred during a um, city project and so while the remains were disinterred we actually store them at the Sherburn house because it was a nearby location where they could be safely kept um, and we're also planning to work closely with the Black Heritage Trail folks in preparation for telling the story of the African-American community of the mid 20th century when we do so at Penn Hallow. Very good. Well, thank you. I will do one last question as I cough. <coughs> are you guys open? <coughs> yeah, good question. We are now open starting on July 1st. We have been hosting outdoor only small group guided tours. Um, and we were all asked to pitch in. So I'm leading tours on Mondays and Wednesdays, which inescapably have a little archeological flavor. So if anybody wants to come to town, 
and sign up for a guided tour, you're welcome to do so. Uh, you know, if things continue to be okay here in New Hampshire, our plan is to be open through the end of October, which is our normal historic house season. Well, great. Well, thank you again, Dr. Martin, for joining us today. And Thanks for having me. Great presentation. And uh, join us in two weeks, everyone, when we have uh, Dr. Um, Christina Douglas, who will be talking about archaeology and communities. Um, she is also an alum of Phillips Academy. And thank you again just to everyone for your time and coming today. So, yes, nice to see everybody.